welcome everybody. We've got a few people in here, awesome. We're actually gonna be talking about something that I talked about just the other day in my intuitive intensive group, which we've got going on at the same time. And I gave a, a long class that day, but I, I wanted to also share this information with everybody else in the lab because I think people don't know it. <laughs> and I think people, well, I see a lot of the posts here in the lab and we have you know varying levels of development for all members and some members have been at this like me like an old gal been at it for about 50 years <laughs> and, and so they have a lot of information and then we have some members who are kind of new to this and so they're asking questions about how to begin and, and what's it all about Alfie and so I wanted to make sure that everybody kind of had this basic information and even for those of us who have been at this game a while, it's not a game, but I mean, who's been at this for a while, like it's good every once in a while just to have a refresher, just a reminder of what's actually happening in this life and what we are capable of and what's truly possible. That's the kind of stuff I love to talk about. I like to talk about what's possible, not because I give it to you because I'm a reader on the internet, not because of any other reason but you discovering for yourself what lives within you. That's, what I, that's why I called this the alive psychic field, because it is. You are psychic. You were born psychic. Whether you are aware of or using your abilities right now is immaterial, quite frankly, because it's just part of who you are. We recently had a post here in this group. I'm sorry, your name is escaping me, who um, actually made this post. Anyway, she just said that she was a little worried because there were so many teachers on the YouTube who talk about the third eye and how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is for people to essentially open their third eye or work with their third eye without really understanding what happens when you open your third eye. And I interacted with her a little bit. Maybe she's here right now. And it was actually a really cool conversation that I think we need to have. But I'm just of the opinion, and I shared this with my intuitive intensive folks, that the pineal gland and therefore the third eye, which is the energetic correlate to your physical pineal gland, it's like, it's like your toe. It's just something you have. And it's something that works. It's something that works for you. Now, this is not to say it's not incredibly powerful because it is. It's not to say that it is not the hub of the entire psychic network in which we all live. It is, but it's also 100% natural. There is nothing to fear about working with your innate intuitive abilities because that's who it is that we are. We're magical people. We were born this way. I think I was just saying last week, that's why we have little babies who are staring off into space and giggling and goo goo ga ga ing and talking to beings because they have that remembrance of who it is that they are and how it is that everything works. They understand, even though they can't articulate on our level, they understand that they're fully connected in every single way. It's with time, with years, with behaviors, it's with patterns that that knowing and that remembrance actually begins to degrade and fall away. And we forget who we are, don't we? We get amnesia and we start misidentifying ourselves and over identifying with the actual reality in which we live, which the 3D earth realm reality, which is super materialistic and super humanistic. We start identifying with that and not with who it is that we truly are and what it is that we truly are. We are magical beings. That's what I wanted to talk with everybody about. Even longtime intuitives, uh, spiritual people, teachers, healers, metaphysicians get burnt out, y'all. They get burnt out and life can wear you down, make you tired and the same thing, the same waves breaking over the same shore of who you are, like that can wear you down. And so it bears reminding, I think. We need to be reminded of our infinite power as divine beings. And we, we need to know what we're working with. So whether you're new to metaphysics or spirituality, whether you're just kind of figuring it out, or whether you're an old dog in this world, <laughs> like myself, been at it for a while, it doesn't matter. Let's reconnect through the truth of who it is that we are. So let's talk about our psychic field. What's a psychic field? I want to start by talking about what I perceive as a clairvoyant person. 
Now, many moons ago, I was a clairvoyant reader. I was an intuitive channel and reader. That's what I did for a living, and I had a lot of different clients. And when I would encounter a client, it wouldn't matter whether they were right in front of me or whether I, they were across the world, we were Skyping or on some sort of a telephone call. When I called their energy up, I saw them in a field. In other words, I saw who it, who it was that they were, their, their body, but I also saw what looked like a sphere around them. And within that sphere, and I would always tell them this, within that fear, excuse me, sphere, there was a lot of activity. There were things like past life information. There were guides that would kind of emerge and show themselves and then sort of recede back into this sphere of operation that they were moving around in. I would see things like trends. I would see timelines. I would see potentialities from which I could then make some predictions based on what was happening in their life right now. I could see patterns. I could also see things like perforations, rips, um, issues in their energy. Everything that was happening in their physical body in terms of wellness and, and a lack of wellness was reflected also in this sphere. And if you can imagine it, what it, within the sphere, it looked completely and intricately and immensely gridded. Like there were lines and intersections and almost like ley lines with different qualities of energy just running through the entire field. And it was through these lines that communications took place. And so as I was, as I was looking at them, and perhaps somebody stepped forward to give a message, they actually stepped into their field that I could see clairvoyantly. And maybe it was a spirit guide and they had a message. They would actually use these connective intersecting grid lines to get the message from the field to me, but also within the field to the person receiving it. So it's like there's these highways and these avenues and these channels of robust communication that's all of which is taking place within the field, but also which extends out from the field into all the other fields that exist. Now, it shouldn't come as a surprise to most of us that, you know, it's not just us and this reality. The reason we're in this group is because we're intrigued by the idea that there's more to life than just what we see with our physical eyes, right? There's more to life than just this life. There has to be. We feel that. We sense that on some level. Well, there is. Outside of this field, this sphere, this incredibly gridded space that's always surrounding us, are other spaces and in particular other grids. Now these grids would be attached to dimensions, other states of reality. These spaces contain all kinds of different energy and also beings. Within us though, okay, within our field, we have hook in, we have points of access and connective points built into us that allow them to hook into us and give us information through our highways and byways and also allow us to extend out from our field, our reality, into theirs. And we do this through a variety of different ways. Um, you know, some basic things we could do would be things like meditation, working with our intention and letting spirit know that we seek to have a rendezvous with the divine like our emissaries or just to understand the higher self and and then to take the requisite time to do something like meditation or prayer or practices that would get us into that connection but that's how we express out but there's all these different spaces playgrounds if you will that we can connect into in order to inform this reality that's how hooked up your psychic field actually is and it's always there, depending upon how enlightened you are. Some of us think we're quite enlightened, don't we? That doesn't mean we are though, <laughs> but depending on how, what enlightenment truly is, is an alignment position and it's an alignment to source energy or to the divine energy, to the higher self, which is so very proximate to source energy. That alignment is like we create a pipeline that allows source to flood into our awareness and verily I say unto you into this field this sphere that we walk around in, it, it allows source to just flood the field with light and where there is light there can be no darkness 
where there is light, there can be no dissonant energy. There can be no negative energy because, of course, the light drives out the darkness. And darkness sounds like a judgment. That's not what we're saying. But a lot of us have lived a lot of life, haven't we? I have. Not by virtue of just the numbers of my age, but the experiences that I've had. And those experiences that we've had have changed us. I was telling my students, and I want to I want to share this with you, and I've actually shared this before, but here again, let's have a refresher. When we were born into this world, we came in with this awesome, tricked out field with grit, and all the gridded lines were perfect, perfectly connecting us to all of the resources, all of the energy, all of the access points. We were absolutely connected in this divine cosmic web. And I would like you to picture your grid upon entrance into this reality, upon birth, as sacred geometry, because truly that's what it is. That's what we are. Sacred geometry. Say, for example, I came in and my pattern, my sacred geometrical grid pattern, my field, was the flower of life. So perfect in its symmetry, so intricate, and so many different connecting points. But again, perfection. That's how we all came into this world. Perfectly formed, both in the physical body. Well, some of us had issues when we came in, but we were, we were whole and we were uncorrupted as of yet. Okay? But as life goes on, and as we meet people and have parents, as we fall in love and then fall out of love, as we meet abusers or become abusers, as we deal with pain and, and suffering, and many of us have been traumatized, the lines, the gridded lines of that beautiful flower of life start to get a little wonky. There comes into the field this misalignment, slowly but surely, and if we don't catch it, or if we don't have a mentor, or a parent, or if we don't have the awareness to bring those things back into alignment, then it, they can continue to get out of order. So that by the time some of us hit 30, or 20, or 40, or some of us even in our teens have been through so very much that by the time we're 18, 19, this beautiful flower of life pattern can look, at least to a clairvoyant, like a Brillo pad. Or you know like that, um, who was that, pig pen? And Charlie Brown had that scribbly black cloud over his head. I think it was pig pen, maybe it was Linus, I forget. But it's kind of like that when you see it clairvoyantly. But all those beautiful, symmetrical, perfectly aligned lines are now out of order. And we're misfiring, we're misreading, or we're not reading at all. We are being triggered, we're reactive. We are responding to prompts and to people and to patterns, patterns that exist within us because of what we've been through and also patterns that continue to enter in through these perforations I speak of or these, these breachable spaces within our field. Part of spirituality, let me rephrase this, true spirituality gets you into alignment with the light because it is only light that brings the alignment back to the flower of life, that returns you to that perfect sacred geometrical pattern with which you came into this life. And this is not to say that where you are now is not divine, because it is. But it is to acknowledge that life and this, this life in particular changes us. It's supposed to. And our job in this life is to find our way back to that alignment to find ways to let the light back in to the life in whatever way that is for you. It's going to be different for you, right, than it is for me because different things light me up with joy and with love. But that's our work. It's to find where the love is, to find where the light is and let that light shine. Let that light fill who it is that we are and also to fill this field. So if we do have rips, and tears and dissonant energy. So if we do have weird energetic patterns, even beings hanging out in our space, all we have to do is bring in the light to raise the signature of the field and eliminate that kind of dissonant. We don't dissonance. We don't have to worry about how that works ever. 
We don't have to know where the perforations are, where the wonky lines are. All we have to know is that light knows how to do what light knows how to do, and it does. We don't have to know exactly how to heal ourselves. Let the great healer do what the great healer knows how to do, which is to heal. We don't, know, we don't need to know how to perform miracles on ourselves or on others. All we have to do is connect to the source of miracles, and then we heal ourselves, or, they, or we are healed. And then we heal others through that connection. That's how it works. The most enlightened on the planet those we would call saints, masters, and avatars, beings like Jesus, beings like Buddha, Babaji, Saint Francis. We could go on and on and on and talk about all these great shining lights on the planet. Their fields were not just open and available to source energy. They weren't just facilitating experiences that allowed them to do what they came here to do, but they were immense, immense. The normal person, the you and the me of it all, <laughs> we have fields that extend maybe, depending, anywhere from two to four, maybe six feet out from our core. So maybe about six feet out. And again, to me, this looks spherical within which there are many grids. It might look different though to a different person perceiving it. But a being like Buddha, miles, miles. A being like Jesus, miles, planetary, around the entire planet. That's how big their field was. And they could perceive within that field. Everywhere they went, of course, they went within this field and everything that entered the field, they were able to perceive and understand and to work with. And so when you've got avatar level consciousness with a field and an awareness zone that spans the globe, they understand and beyond, beyond Gaia, in, into other areas and dimensions. They are perceiving on this expanded level. That's what we want. We want to widen this field. We want to bring in the light and refine by fire in this way. By bringing in the light, we bring back the alignment. We want to do all of that, but we also want to keep saturating with that light because that's what grows the field. And soon we're perceiving more than just what's happening in our own lives, in our own body, in our own circumstance. As the field extends, so does our compassion and our care because the field is now the size of your community, maybe your city, maybe your whole country. You have an awareness zone and a field that encompasses all of this and you can feel into that and you can sense into that and you can use the space of that to do all kinds of things, read, get information, knowledge, express out, find the connection points, the ley line intersections, if you will, in specific geographical locations. I'm getting a little crazy, but truly, if you're walking around with a 20 mile sphere, say, and you go into a city, your sphere is going to be able to, your psychic awareness zone is going to be able to feel where the energy is in that city or on that land or in that group of people because it encompasses the entire thing. We're all working with that. We all have access to that. It's part of who we are. We just can't see it with these eyes. We can see it with the inner eye. Some of us can see it with the open eye. Sometimes when we're first starting to see, by the way, when we're first starting to develop our clair clairvoyance, we actually see sparks in the air, like little pinpricks of light or flashes of light, very small, very quick, sometimes just on the periphery. But this is us perceiving within this sphere that we exist in. I was telling my students that I kind of liken it to a spaceship <laughs> because if you're going to go out in space, you're going to need a ship, right? And you're going to have to have everything you need in that ship. 
You're going to have to have a comm system, meaning a communication system. You're going to have to be able to talk to other members within the ship. And you're also going to have to be able to send messages back to your home planet or beyond and receive messages from the home planet and beyond. You have to have an extensive communication system. You have life support systems. You have to have an ability to interact with the space that you're in, doing things like space walks, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like that, though. It's kind of like we exist in our little ship, which is the field. And I'll tell you something. Many of the orbs that people are seeing, these big, sometimes golden, but, but light-filled orbs that people are seeing float into their room, float outside in front of them as they're walking or as they're sitting. These orbs, I believe, are the ships. They're the fields that encompass beings. That's why when we see, some people see UFOs or they'll see craft or they'll see some sort of an anomaly, it'll come into their pers perspective and then it'll wink out transdimensionally. It'll just be gone. A lot of folks, Jacques Vallée would be one, think that this is actually the energetic system of the being as it is traveling interdimensionally. The Merkaba, if you will, the vehicle in which we all exist. You can call it a vehicle, you can call it a Merkaba, you could call it your spaceship, your own USS Enterprise, I don't care. What you have to understand though is that you come into this world and exist in this world with all of this equipment and all of this ability. It's not just you and your awareness and your consciousness, which is of course divine and sovereign. It's all also this system with everything that you need. And if you wanna strengthen the system, expand the system, know more, feel more, then you can do that. You can expand this light ship, your glitter light ship, I think is what Justine calls it, the, the glitter spaceship, starship. You can expand it by aligning yourself back to the source of all things, that energy we would call God energy or that energy we would call creator. God doesn't care what you call God. You could call God Bob, he wouldn't care. You could call God Susie, doesn't care, does not care. But God is, light is, and love is, and that is from where we come. And because we are of it, created from it, therefore of it, we always have access back to it, always. Through the cord, the channel, the umbilicus of our spirit, which exists within us and around us and is also within this field, through the function of that cord that can never be broken, we can receive, we, we have a calm system, we can speak to our home planet, which is God which is the I am, which is the higher self. We always have access to that and it's through that channel that we can then usher in the light. The light which again finds the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it because darkness never will. Light is the strongest, the most powerful. Love and divinity is the most powerful. It is the strongest energy that there is. That's what we're connected to. That's what we're walking around in. That's the possibility of it all. That's the hope of it all. Don't you see you are a connected, sovereign being with access to infinite resources, infinite resources. It's easy, however, in 3D reality to forget all that. Just as when we started, I said, babies come in, they know. They have the remembrance, they have the gnosis. Oh yeah, I get how this all works. But soon they lose their memory. This dimension is sticky. We get stuck here. We get myopia or myopia. We get this tunnel vision where all we see is what's right in front of us. This job, this bank account, this illness, this problem. And we don't see, we don't look up to see what we're really working with and what we are connected to, which is vast and so very beautiful. And so this is how we suffer. This is how we feel so alone and disconnected.
as if we're cut off. How come everybody else understands? How come everybody else has a connection? How come everybody else is intuitive? What about me? It's like I'm cut off and there's none for me. Well, that's not true. That's not true at all. The opposite is true. For those of you who, like me, came out of Christianity, and maybe you're still in Christianity. I, I consider myself to be an esoteric Christian, not a legalist one, but I'm, I'm an esoteric Christian. You might remember the story of Elijah. Let me tell you something about that guy. He was a badass. You didn't want to mess with Elijah because he would call down the fire from heaven and believe me, it would show up and it would smite everything. And he was feared in his day, rightly so. He had aligned himself with the Most High God. He had aligned himself with the Source. He had tapped into and was a match for that power. And because of that, he had enemies. Dueling, adversarial, oppositional religions and faiths and priesthoods. They hated him. They wanted him gone. And in fact, the monarch of the day, her name was Jezebel. We hear that name and it means something these days, but that was actually a queen. It was Queen Jezebel. And she hated Elijah because he routinely embarrassed her priests and her religious political system. Routinely called them out and challenged them or they him. And he always won. He always won. And so one day, Jezebel says, I've had enough of this oaf and I want him dead. We're not going to put up with this anymore. We're not going to do challenges. We're not going to go meet him on a hill so he can bring the, bring the um, thunder. <laughs> We're just going to kill him. And so she put a hit on him. And word got to Elijah that the queen had done this. And this is the first time we ever see in the Bible with Elijah that he gets afraid. He becomes afraid. He's struck with a spirit of fear. And he starts to run. And we follow Elijah through the passages as he's running and, and he's running through towns and he's running through forests and he's just running. He's so afraid. Why? We don't really know what made him so afraid about that, but he must have believed it. He must have believed he was going to die. And the entire time that Elijah ran, God was trying to get his attention. And you know, spirit does that. Our emissaries are always like, hello, what are, you, what are you doing? There's nothing to fear. We're right here. You're walking around in your glitter starship. You've got access to all this cool stuff. Stop. You don't have to be afraid. God was chasing him or with him the whole time. But Elijah felt cut off and could not hear the word of God. And there's this poignant moment where Elijah is hiding in a cave. And outside the mouth of this cave... God is making these incredible, grand displays of power, thunder and lightning and gushes of, or rushes of wind and all of this, all these evidences to show Elijah, what are you doing? I'm the most high God. You got nothing to fear if I am on your side and you are on mine. When you're clicked into alignment, what are you running for? Crash of thunder, bolt of lightning. And Elijah doesn't even notice it. He's just thinking, oh, storm outside, but I'm so afraid. And Elijah continues to run. He doesn't notice when God sends those messages, just as so many of us don't notice when God sends those messages. But at some point, and here we've got Elijah just getting run down on the trail, at some point, God finally gets Elijah's attention. I don't know. I don't recall exactly how it happened. But essentially, I paraphrase. He said, Elijah, you ding dong, stop for a second. Just stop for a second. And Elijah does. Elijah hears that. Elijah feels that. And God says, turn around and look at the mountaintop. And Elijah does. Turns around, looks at the mountaintop. And there, all along the top of the mountain, is an army of angels. Michael with his sword, chariots, angels ready to do battle on behalf of Elijah. They've been tracking him, running with him, going with him, moving with him all the time. 
In that one moment, God gave Elijah eyes to see exactly how supported he was. Exactly how connected he was. And God said, this is all yours. I've provided it for you. There's nothing to fear. And finally, the spell is broken. And Elijah says, aha, I am a ding dong. I'm running for no reason. I, I serve the most high. And he goes back to town or into the city and it's a terrible ending for Jezebel. We won't get into it. Well, she's eaten by dogs, but it's terrible. But this is a great story because most of us, our lives resemble Elijah on the trail, Elijah in the cave. Most of us are living lives like Elijah running not seeing, not hearing, not noticing the signs, not understanding that to which we are truly connected. And yet there are moments, aren't there, of clarity for us where we get a sense of, Whew, I am more powerful. I am more powerful than I ever knew. And you are. Some of us have visions, we have dreams, we are able to see things and we can see, whoa, I am so much more connected. I am operating and accessing and connecting to all of these divine resources all the time. Lightworkers, get up off your knees. Stand up. There's nothing to fear. You have everything you need right now. And if you think you don't, you're wrong. You do. You do. And the only person in the power position here is you. The only one who can change your situation is you. And the only way you can change your situation is by finding that click in position for you. That state of alignment that exists inside of you. Again, different for you than it is for me finding that and hanging out there for as long as possible, letting the light pour in because the light finds the darkness and roots it out. And too many of us have a lot of darkness still inside of us, doubts, uncertainties, anxieties, worries, don't we? The cure for that is always the light. The cure for that is always the love. Source didn't send you into this life Higher self didn't dispatch you into this life without giving you a toolbox, a blueprint, and a starship, a field that is always responding, always responding to what it is that you need, where it is that you are. And that's the truth. So do you feel, by a show of hearts, I want, to, I want to actually mention this because, you know, sometimes I talk on things, we all do, we talk on things that seem so fantastical, don't they, that the rational mind would say, hogwash, what a load of bollocks, right? But do you feel it? That's the question you have to ask yourself. When I say that to you, turn around and look on the mountaintop. Do you feel it? You know why? Because it's true. And the spirit bears witness to that which is true. The body bears witness. The goosebumps come. The constriction of the scalp. We've got electricity in the body. Why? Because this is bearing witness to that which is true. That's who you are. My mission in life is for you to understand who you are. Powerful. Lightworker, get up off your knees. Stand up. Do your work. That's what we're here to do.